Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the More Than GDP debate. My name is Patricia Larry. I'm business journalist and host and anchor of Swiss television. So, how's life? Are you happy? Actually, hands up if you are. Okay, <laughs> this looks really that you're in an overall good mood. I like it, that's nice, it's excellent. But the problem is that old concepts of economics and politics fail to measure our well-being, your well-being. And because they rely heavily, still heavily rely on GDP growth figures. And GDP means basically more stuff, more progress. Uh, but GDP fails to measure, for example, inequality, distribution of income and sustainability. So it's absurd. It's kind of absurd. More crime, more pollution, more natural catastrophes, and even more divorces add on to the GDP. So, and crucial, I think one crucial point as well is it was invented in analog times. So how is the digital economy measured? So the question is, what are the alternatives actually? Fact is a growing number of very diverse countries, they really try to find alternatives. They collect alternative data and try to measure the well-being of their people and tailor policies accordingly. And so that's why I would love to introduce you two countries which are doing this already, New Zealand and the Emirates. And I would love to introduce to you Jacinda Ardern, Prime Minister of New Zealand. She is the youngest female head of gover government in the world. Welcome. Next to her, Ahud Al Rumi. And I think she's got um, the most exciting top title of all the participants here in Davos. <laughs> <laughs> she is a Minister um, for State of Happiness and Wellbeing in the Emirates. So welcome, you two. And on the other side, for your orientation, we have more the science and concept guys. So I will... Uh, right. <laughs> so, this, so just real life cases, and here is more the research and the concepts. On, um, <laughs> next to me is Angel Gurria. Everybody knows him, of course. He's the Secretary General, General of the OECD, former banker and Minister for, of Foreign Affairs and Finance of Mexico. And next to him, we have Eric Brynjolfsson. I think um, he's very well known in the digital community as well. Of course, he's author and professor. He has written a best selling book, The Second Machine Age. And he is the MIT director of the, or is the director of the MIT Initiative for the Digital Economy. Welcome. And last but not least, I mean, these two anyways, these two professors are the two of the world's leading intellectuals, I would say. So we're really proud to have them here as well. Mariana Mazzucato, Italian-American anti-mainstream anti economist, too, if I can put it so. It's, she's a professor and also um, author of best-selling books. And she is really asking, um, and claims we should really think about which part of the economy is really creating value. And she's, advisor, she's advising the European Commission and the UN as well. So I'm really glad that you're here. And it's also about the power of one single number today, this panel. A hopefully shrinking power of one single number. I ask all the participants to bring me their most important figure of their life. So which numbers really count in life? So Jacinda Ardent, let's start with you. You brought eight. The number eight. Um, I, I very recently um, had uh, a baby and back in New Zealand uh, uh, when this was learned, the, uh, a group of indigenous New Zealanders, Māori, gifted me um, the, the number eight, Waru, um, as a name for my, uh, for my baby. We did not name her Waru, um, so, <laughs> um, but she is the eighth grandchild in my family, and I think children bring true joy and happiness, so we're thinking about ways to put children at the heart of everything we do and enhance our well-being. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, quite different a figure you brought to us. Um, 
Oh, what, 50, what does, does it mean? So 50 is a number that I'm proud of as women in politics. Uh, our National Council, which is the parliament, is by law is 50% uh, female, which is, I think, one of the highest percentages in the world, and I'm really proud of this. So next federal council elections, by law, 50% women. Female. Yeah, female. That's a fact we, um, I think, a lot of people don't know. And thank you so much. So it's about inclusion and inclusive growth also. Let's look at the other side. Um, very interesting figures. Oh, 1969 looks like a flower power fan. Angel <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gurria, oh, you, where, why did you brought this figure? It is the year in which the man stepped on the moon. Wow. Uh -huh. And uh, that night, I was under such an impact because of this momentous event that I declared to my then a girlfriend. And, uh, well, she accepted. And then uh, four years later, we got married, and it's been 45 years since. Uh, but the question is, of course, uh, 69, uh, very, very much embedded in my mind for both reasons, you know? <laughs> Of course, the most Progress important one being... And love. Uh, <laughs> and then I stopped her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So, and this one, Eric Benioff, of course, scientist. Mm. You brought another form of eight. It's in <laughs> infinity. So what's behind this infinity figure? Well, it, it's just a reminder about the, the boundless opportunities. And although we seek to, to measure GDP and some of these other metrics, that there's always a, a potential for more growth, more progress going forward. I, I want us to keep that in mind. It's also a reminder to be humble about any number trying to quantify things. There's some things that can't easily be quantified, however hard we try, although we keep getting closer and closer. Uh, it was Albert Einstein, I think, who said that uh, uh, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. And so this is a little reminder, both of the the optimism I have, but also the, the humbleness of trying to uh, uh, measure things. And it's kind of poetic, thank you. And Mariana, four, so it's the lowest number. <laughs> uh, I chose four because I have four children who live in London and go to schools that are state schools. I didn't say public because for some reason in the UK, public means private. Yeah. Doctor, forget it. Um, and so I am four times aware of how um, badly or how unable we are to value public education. We only include the costs, so the salaries of the teachers in GDP. We don't actually calculate or value what is actually produced. A well-functioning education system is not something that we know how to value in GDP, only the salary. So there's no way to even show how productive, say, an education system is because we don't know how to value the output. And four children going to state schools in London is fantastic, but also very hard in an era in which those schools are being cut in terms of public funding of education. Oh, thank you so much for um, your appeal, actually, already. And you see, what I wanted to show to you, it's all these numbers which really matters most to us. It's about family, about relationship, about inclusion, inclusive growth, about pro progress as well, and um, love, poetry, and yeah, again, family. And this, is, this GDP doesn't care about all this kind of stuff. So. Um, What's the problem? And I think in the first section, short section of this panel, we try to wrap up again what's the problem really with GDP because I still think it's not common knowledge because everybody's so obsessed with it. So, um, Eric, I think um, let's try it um, in a nutshell. What's really the problem with GDP? Well, before I talk about the problem, let me just briefly say GDP is an amazing invention. And I know we're going to spend most of the panel talking about the problems. But uh, Paul Samuelson, uh, the great economist, said that GDP and, it, and its related uh, concepts was one of the greatest uh, inventions of the 20th century. And I agree with that. Um, it, before that, we had very poor measures of how the economy was doing. And when Simon Kuznets and his team developed GDP in the 1930s, we started getting a much clearer understanding of how the economy was doing and, and what production was. But at the same time, it, it does measure everything. And there is no one number that will capture 
everything. Just as when you're driving in a car, it wouldn't make sense to average together the, the speed and the how much gas you have in the tank and the oil pressure and the, the temperature in your air conditioner into one number. That would be a useless number. Similarly, we can't expect GDP to measure everything in the economy. It, it, it specifically, GDP was designed and is a measure of production. It's how much we produce. But that is very different than well-being or happiness, as, as, you, uh, as you asked. It's possible that well, if welfare, something- Welfare. Oh, no. uh, welfare, yeah. exactly. Um, it's possible that if something becomes less expensive, if you substitute Wikipedia for Encyclopedia Britannica, you get a lot more knowledge for free. Um, and GDP actually goes down, because the production cost is less. But I would think that most of us would agree that our well-being, our welfare, goes up. So you can see GDP and welfare are two different concepts. Nonetheless, many economists, and I'd probably most journalists, use GDP as if it's a synonym mm -hmm. for welfare. We say, oh, we grew 2.3%. This economy is doing better or worse. And uh, that is a, a, a sloppy shorthand. And I think the reason we do that is because it's really the, the almost the only game in town. It's measured with great precision. Every government does it with, with great detail, great care. And um, the fact that we have this number, it, it's, it's like a magnet that attracts our attention. And what's more, many other statistics are based on GDP. For instance, productivity. You always hear about productivity, you know, which is a, a measure of how we are improving our living standards. Productivity is just GDP divided by hours worked. So again, if GDP is not a measure of welfare, then neither is productivity going to be a measure of, of how we're improving welfare. Ultimately, we need to develop new separate measures, and I'm so glad that in New Zealand, the United Arab Emirates, and many other places, we are, people are working on alternative measures. And ultimately, I don't think there's going to be just one number. It's going to be a dashboard that keeps track of, of how education is contributing, as Mariana suggested, happiness, Robert Kennedy, I think, said it very poetically. He said that the GDP doesn't measure the beauty of our poetry, the clean, cleanliness of our air, the happiness of our children. In short, it doesn't measure all the things that makes life, life worth well. living. And that's something I think we can do better on. Thank you so much. Do you agree, Mariana? Is it really um, GDP doesn't really measure progress in people's welfare? So, I mean, I think I, I agree with what Eric said, and something that I would add is that it's being misused in the sense of, you know, whether we're actually growing or not growing by 0.04, 0.1%, and it was never actually meant to do that. It wasn't actually meant to really steer economies at that level. On the other hand, it's not being actually used to steer economies at a bigger level. So, for example, in the UK where I live, uh, the source of growth, right, you, you can break down GDP in all sorts of different ways. If you break it down by demand, so the different sources of demand, consumption, investment demand, government demand to build roads and bridges um, and net exports, the difference between these different components isn't necessarily given enough attention. So in the UK, we've been mainly growing through consumption-led growth, and that consumption has been fueled by private debt, so that the ratio of private debt to disposable income is back to what it was just before the crisis. And guess what? That's actually what caused the crisis. So that sort of big headline figure, which we can get from GDP, so the source of growth, in some ways, isn't really out there. I mean, I don't think enough people realize just how dangerous it is in terms of you know, just constantly fueling uh, growth in that unsustainable way. And it's not a coincidence, by the way, if real wages haven't increased since the 1980s, lots of this debt is being taken on simply to, um, if you want, uh, uh, maintain existing living standards. But another really interesting issue is that this difference between value creation, you were saying that it's supposed to be measuring how much we produce, um, so that would sort of you know, resonate with the term creating something. But the difference between value creation and value extraction, which was so important to economists like Adam Smith, where they really tried to differentiate in their measure of output, the difference between profits and rents, mm -hmm. where rent was really seen as kind of just moving things around, not necessarily creating anything new, we have a hard time to do that because we're only including in GDP something that has a price. So we don't ask whether, say, mm -hmm. a particular part of the financial sector is actually adding value simply because it's charging a fee or even the net interest payments now since the 1970s are included into GDP through the service of financial intermediation or risk taking. We don't actually then ask ourselves, but 
you know, is the private equity industry actually creating value or is it just moving things around? Because we do make that judgment with other things like social security payments don't go into GDP because it's obvious that it's just redistributing income from one part of the economy to another. But I do think that there's this lack of attention to that difference, which was really important to David Ricardo, Adam Smith, Karl Marx. And I think we can learn quite a bit by going back to the class schools and understanding their perspective, which was very much on this kind of objective uh, take on what was happening with technology, machinery, division of labor, the kind of objective conditions of production. And frankly speaking, it's also just nonsense to talk about um, if GDP is going up 1.2 and, yeah. Well, if you speaking. marry your cleaner, GDP goes down. Yeah. What does that tell you? <laughs> Not much. Um, so. This is mean. <laughs> no, but it is like it is. And I mean, At you least your clinic keeps charging, which they should. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or you should value that work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Unpaid have, exactly. work. Exactly. <laughs> Jacinda, look at your case. I mean, the why question. Why did you choose that you have to... Yeah, that GDP is not enough for well, you. Well, not least because, actually, mm -hmm. uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find a politician who would say, why did you go into politics? Well, to increase GDP. <laughs> I mean, it's not our driving force in politics, actually. Most politicians, regardless of where they're on the spectrum, you can distill it down to, in some form, increasing the well-being of their people. They have just different ideas on, and manner in which to do that. But actually, I think the importance of addressing this gap that we have in measuring success and broadening out what success is actually gets to the heart of politics and our political crisis. Now, if you are, are a person sitting at home and post the GFC, hear a politician stand up and say, well, according to what's happening to GDP, we are now in recovery phase, which many politicians did at various points in the cycle, and yet you're sitting there saying, I don't feel that. My situation is not improving. Uh, then that means that you have a disconnect and you have that increase in that lack of trust in your institutions and your democracy. And I really think that we've got a number in our political environment now of issues that are becoming proxies for a distrust in institutions delivering for people. So what's one way that we can address that issue? Uh, well, one way is to make sure that, well, what gets measured gets done. We start broadening out the things that we hold ourselves to account on. Uh, and it's, it, how our economy is tracking absolutely matters. Look, in New Zealand, we're roughly projecting 3% um, growth. Our unemployment's at 3.9% on traditional measures, budget surpluses. People would look at us and go, you're doing okay. But we have homelessness at mm. staggering rates. Mm. One of the highest rates of youth suicide in the OECD. Our mental health and well-being is not what it should be. So our plan is through the well-being work that we're doing, a living standards framework and our well-being budget, where if you're a minister, you want to spend money, you have to prove that you are going to improve intergenerational well-being. We are hoping to embed in actually what the public is asking us for, to address the societal well-being of our nation, not just our economic well-being. And did you have the same problem as the US? I mean, GDP went up and up and up, but the disposable household income went down. We've been called, a, during the post-GFC environment, we were called a rock star economy. Mm -hmm. You know, people look to us as an example, I think, of, a, of an economy that recovered quickly. And yet, during that period, some of those statistics were, were exactly that, so, you know, staggering. And not a measure of success, I think, that we would hold ourselves to. The trick for us is not just using well-being and some of the OECD work uh, around different measures of well-being as a scorecard, because it would be very easy, I think, to, to just say, well, here's some uh, new things that we're going to create data sets around. Instead of just scoring ourselves, how do we embed it in our decision-making? And I think that's what New Zealand is doing differently. This year, our well-being budget is one example. We're also changing our Public Finance Act to say you must include well-being priorities. We've even said, for instance, you now, we now have to report on child poverty numbers every time we deliver a budget. Mm. We're fundamentally changing the way that we do policy making uh, to make sure that we deliver on, on well-being, <laughs> not just uh, economic success. We'll talk about these um, alternatives and this policy change as well. Same is happening in the Emirates, but why were you all of a sudden thinking this GDP figure is not enough for us. We want, we want more. So thank you, Patricia. Let mm -hmm. me tell you about the UAE context. 
So we are the most successful economic model in the Arab world. By West standards, we are among the most competitive economies in the world, and we have enjoyed high GDP uh, growth during the past two decades. So our story in the UAE is not a gap story. It's an aspirational story. When my prime minister, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, took over as the UAE prime minister 10 years ago, he started pondering about the higher role of government beyond just services or enacting laws. What is the higher purpose for the government? And actually, he wrote a book about it, mentioning happiness as the higher purpose for the government work and how to bring positivity into politics and into policy making. And he believed that this higher role of government would not be delivered with government as we know it, or with business as usual. Therefore, the UAE government decided to create a ministerial post for happiness to enact this paradigm shift and move towards a future of government pivoted on well-being. This is not add on to government. This is a paradigm shift of how government works and thinks. Cultural shift. Yes. So, yeah. And talking about GDP and just following on what Eric said, um, in my other hat as the head of the Prime Minister's office in the UAE, we run a holistic and advanced performance management system. But when we look at the well being lens, we as a government, we need to go beyond just mere the traditional indicators that the usually governments look like. And let me give you one example. If I take the healthcare sector, usually governments around the world, they look at cost, access, timeliness, and quality, which might not tell the whole story or the full story of human well-being when it comes to health. They don't, for example, capture our personal choices, which makes up to 50% of what makes us healthy. So GDP is good. We need to supplement GDP, and we need to relook at all indicators of government with the well-being. Happiness is the higher purpose for the government. Well-being is the platform, is the ecosystem to achieve that. Mm -hmm. It's a different, um, but it's quite still it's quite similar. So also from and your policy making, you're um, oriented accordingly. But we'll look at the solutions. Andre Guria, I mean you are early, you're an actually trendsetter. You're an early mover since I think a decade ago. You tried to find alternatives and you created the Better Life Index. Why did you create this? Um, you weren't satisfied with the GDP either anymore. It's not about the GDP, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's move aside from the GDP. The GDP is, as was mentioned by Eric, uh, is a fine measurement. It is meant to measure certain things, mm -hmm. but what happened is that society, circumstances, they were telling us, you know, what were the legacies of the crisis? The legacies of the crisis were low growth, that was GDP, but then uh, destruction of jobs, and then there was a growing inequalities mm -hmm. and a destruction of trust in everything we built over the last 100 years. So uh, this, this uh, ambition to go beyond GDP, and then we said, no, it's GDP and beyond, mm -hmm. and not beyond GDP. Right. You'd never leave uh, GDP behind. You go beyond. Yes. We created the Better Life Index precisely to reflect the response to the question of the inequalities. The, the inclusive growth story, which has to be the response to the inequalities. And this is what we wanted to put in the front burner. Uh, this is uh, what we uh, call the Better Life Index. And this is what mankind is now calling the SDGs. 17 goals, uh, 169 uh, targets. 230 indicators, all of which are GDP and beyond, because none of them is saying a measure GDP. Right. Mm -hmm. They're all breaking down in all these hundreds of indicators. They're trying to find out more about me, about <laughs> you. They're trying to find out about women, about children, they're trying to about, about the elderly, about the most vulnerable, about the services we can provide about what people are expecting. Why uh, does the Czech Republic take nine months to form a government and, and uh, Rute 
takes seven months to form a government in the Netherlands, and, and Merkel takes uh, five months to form a government, and then even uh, in Sweden, the most egalitarian country in the world, you take four months to form a government, and then the uh, unexpected results in Italy, and the unexpected results in places like Mexico, or uh, like Brazil, and then uh, uh, the United States itself, Brexit, etc. What is this all telling us? There is a common threat, which is hundreds of millions of people do not like their state in life. They're looking for something else, and it behooves us as systemic responsibles to be able to find that. And this is the search process that we are involved in. Uh, so it's nothing to do with GDP. It has to do with the quality of life. It has to do with the integration of migrants into our societies. It has to do with the complementarity of the virtues or the skills that people need in order to make it happen for them, you know? So how do you focus on their own uh, uh, well-being? This is about getting narrower and narrower and narrower to the individual well-being, but then it is about policies. The OECD is about better policies for better lives. So how do you actually turn these measurements once you get the findings? And there, I would say, with the, the Prime Minister, I will depart a little bit from that, is a, we do need a set of indicators because we need to make it comparative. Yeah. We need to have a benchmarking to then be able to set from there what are the better policies, what will actually uh, go in the direction and of well-being. And the international standard, probably. Um, but maybe I have to put it right, because it's correct, the GDP, you can't say it's just the GDP the problem, but that we are obsessed, the media is obsessed, the financial markets, the rating agencies, everybody is obsessed, still obsessed with the GDP, even if you already, if you, you've already launched other alternative indices 10 years ago. To say, and actually, before we move on to the solution parts, are there any questions concerning problems or misunderstandings with GDP? Uh, we take questions from the audience, if you have or anything not so clear. But if everything is clear, is there? There is one question behind. Yeah, thank you. Could you identify yourself? Uh, my name is Rutger Brackman. I'm a historian, and I was wondering. You know, not many people know that the inventor. Of Uh, and the financial sector. So I, I have heard a little bit about it in the discussion from Mariana, but shouldn't we talk more about the distinction mm -hmm. uh, between makers and takers? Because now that's both included in GDP. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the real debate. That's the elephant in the room mm -hmm. right here. Good point. I think, Eric, you can take your question. As uh, you know, so I, I think, it, uh, let me come back to a point I made earlier. There is no one number. And if you want to, from the Federal Reserve, maybe you want to know how money is being spent. If from a well-being perspective, you want to ask different questions. If you want to know about who's getting the money in the redistribution, you want to measure a different number. So Simon Kuznets, you're absolutely right. He, he, they had to make a lot of judgment calls about what was included and what does, wasn't included. For instance, uh, as we heard earlier, he decided not to include in his team uh, household production. And many people are creating satellite accounts now that account for it. He did include. Uh, uh, some of the, the um, other parts that are more redistribution. But I don't think the answer, and, and, and so if you look at the, the national accounts, for instance, in the United States, there are actually a whole set of satellite accounts that include or don't include different parts uh, of this. And you can look at different subsets. And ultimately, I think there, you can think of a, a, a kind of a spectrum, maybe it's not one dimensional, but to oversimplify a little bit, where you have a very narrow measure of GDP, um, and then you can add more and more components to it that, that measure broader things, perhaps not as precisely, all the way going to, to a, a happiness index, which is very difficult, difficult to measure. Um, and this spectrum of different measures will give you different indicators. Um, but but I, I think that this quest yeah. to say, what is the one precise way, it really depends very much on what is the question you're asking. Uh, for your particular question, I could see a good argument for not including some of the things that are in GDP, but for other purposes, you would want to. Mariana, you I, frowned. Um, are oh, you happy? Sorry, I didn't mean You're to not frown. happy. Um, <laughs> we, she's always happy. I'm always happy. <laughs> what's your, what's your uh, happiness on a one to ten scale? No, I've seen it. I've seen her face. Um, <laughs> right. So first of all, up until 1970, actually, the financial sector, broadly defined, was more or less not included. 
the only things that were included from finance were those areas that you actually had to pay a fee. So if you went and got a mortgage, you had to pay the mortgage provider a fee. That was included. The but fee, those, but not the interest, yeah. Yeah, so the net interest payments of banks weren't included. And then what happened, which was very interesting, was the SNA, Standardization of National Accounts Group, mm -hmm. and the right. UN, they were like, uh-oh, this thing, this blob called finance is actually growing to enormous levels. And instead of sort of pausing and saying, why? What part of finance is growing? What is it actually doing? Is it actually adding value to the real economy? Hyman Minsky talked about the capital development of the economy, that that should be one of the roles of finance. They just kind of said, oh, we better include it. So commercial banks, their net interest payments got put in. In, as, um, in terms of the NEPA accounts, national income and profit accounts, it was called financial intermediation. And the investment banks' net interest payments were included as risk taking. What was really curious is that after the GFC, the big financial crisis, um, the governments of the world basically had to bail out these large investment banks. We didn't also kind of pause and saying, wait, you know, who's taking the risks? You know, given those actually the taxpayers who had to bail out the risk taking of the investment banks, it's just curious though that in the national income and product accounts, still today, there's this risk taking service that we're sort of assuming that the Goldman Sachs's take on. Now, this isn't to say that we should or should not be including finance. I, in fact, think that someone like Adam Smith was too kind of brutal and deterministic. He actually had a list of those sectors he thought were productive and those that were unproductive. I think what we should be asking is how can we actually render the financial sector more productive, to really fuel growth in the real economy, to be useful in terms of tackling the kind of missions and sustainable development goals that Anhed was talking about. And that, though, isn't necessarily the point of GDP. That's about the kind of debate we should be having um, in politics and between e economists. But the problem is that then if we start misusing GDP, those conversations become more difficult. By the way, Italy, where I'm from, as actually hasn't had a very high deficit historically. It's been lower than Germany's, um, but it has a high debt to GDP. So you'd think that people would pause and say, oh, wait a second, why are we obsessing about deficits in Europe with these kind of voodoo numbers like 3% when actually some countries that have low deficits have high debt to GDPs? And there, GDP would actually be useful because we know that a long-run driver of GDP is the investments that are being made in human capital and education and research and innovation, and a country like Italy hasn't been making those investments. The denominator is low. So the denominator doesn't grow. No. So even if the numerator is growing at 2 3%, it's not such a high number, that ratio can go to infinity because the <laughs> denominator isn't growing. But that conversation in Europe has not been had. We told the pigs, I'm allowed to use the word pigs because I'm Italian, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, a terrible word that Goldman Sachs came up with, um, not me. Um, we just told them cut, cut, cut when actually it was precisely that they hadn't been investing in the structures and the kind of you know, dynamic structures that are needed for long run uh, GDP growth. But that <coughs> lesson you know, didn't sort of happen. And so the illness was misdiagnosed and the patient is getting sicker. Thank you so much for the question. And I would suggest to move on with the solutions and alternative parts, because we really want to know more about yeah, how you handle it. I mean, 10 years ago, there, were, there weren't really real life cases which um, have taken dashboards or alternative indices into politics. Um, just in the Arden, how do we have to imagine? Uh, can you uh, give us some insights? How yeah, you sure. do it? <laughs> and I touched on that a, a little bit in my in my earlier comments, but just to respond, I think a bit. You know, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, the uh, GDP is here to stay. Um, and no one's arguing that that won't uh, therefore continue to exist in our psyche and our analysis uh, around how we're tracking and our, pro our progress, not least because it actually gives us a, a comparator. Um, but uh, th there's no doubt that debate will continue to rage um, around what, what is included and what is not. I think, therefore, the learnings from the importance of having those comparators is still useful. So uh, I think the work that the OECD has has done around the Better Life Index has been incredibly useful in that regard. Do you use it as well? Yes, we do, and mm -hmm. we've used that um, because, as you say, data matters, measurement yes. matters. Uh, it, it's not always easy uh, when no. you move into the well-being space. And to give you an example of where we uh, uh, have some challenges, we've used um, uh, some of the work that's been done by the OECD to inform what we're calling a living standards framework. Now, that's owned by our Treasury. Um, and the important part of that being owned by one of our departments is that we want this to endure beyond a three-year political cycle. Uh, as much as I would love to stay and continue on in politics till I'm old and grey, 
I wouldn't like to stay on in politics till I'm old and grey, <laughs> but I would love to see there be at least some enduring commitment to these new measures and new ways of doing things. So having that embedded within our Treasury makes that possible. So I've used that data set to inform it, uh, that work to inform our living standards framework. Now off the back of that, as I already mentioned, we're changing some other things around the way we, we do things. We're not just measuring new things, our, uh, our well-being across a, a whole a range of different uh, four capitals, uh, which has its limitations because they're often yeah. individual data sets. Uh, we're looking, we're deriving right down into what's happening for individuals, but not necessarily mm -hmm. uh, looking at the well-being of our communities, particularly difficult for our Indigenous New Zealanders and Pacifica communities, uh. because they derive so much of their well-being around their connectedness to communities. So, mm. uh, look, there's some struggles, again, around what we do with unpaid work and, and value and, and measure some of that. But that aside, that um, then is informing and dictating what we do in our next budget. And as I said... And do you do surveys, your own surveys? We do, we do. Um, uh, for instance, we do our own household income surveys to look at um, material deprivation or, uh, for children um, and households. We, we want to know whether or not you can afford healthy meals, whether or not you're sharing rooms in your home, whether you can afford uh, multiple pairs of shoes, indicators of quality of life. So we do um, uh, do that work. But what, we, what differentiates us probably from others is what we're doing around our budget. Mm -hmm. So usually, as you'll know, budgets mm -hmm. uh, in the past perhaps looked at uh, simply inputs. You know, how much are we spending on health? Now, over the years, uh, many economies have changed that to be able to communicate that better to the public. So instead of just saying we spend the X, you know, millions or billions of dollars, we, that then translated into how many operations are we purchasing and delivering. No. Mm. Um, now we're actually starting to say, well, actually, does that necessary, is that a good indicator um, of uh, the health uh, of our people? Uh, so now we are looking at outcomes, not just how much we're spending on health and how many uh, operations, but actually how well are our people What's their life expectancy likely to be? Um, uh, and uh, when you start looking at things in that so broad context... So you put more money into education? Well, actually, no, it's health not just... And you, you stop looking just at mm. health. So if mm. I'm saying how healthy um, are the New Zealand people uh, and what's contributing to their health, we might then start looking at some things like the work we have out of our longitudinal studies. We, in the 1970s, started... Uh, studying uh, the well-being of our kids from birth right up until their adulthood. And what we learned from that was a child that grows up in poverty is more likely, even when they come out of poverty, to have the health impacts later in life. So if we're looking at how healthy our people are, we're not just then looking at how many surgeries we perform with them. Actually, we then go right back to the beginning and saying, are they a child living in poverty? Because if we don't fix that, our health system picks it up later down the track. So, in practical terms, what does it mean? Well, this budget, any minister who wants to deliver a bid and say, I want to spend some money here, has to show how it will benefit us at an intergenerational level. They also have to work with other ministers. So the Minister of Health might want to work with the Minister of Child Poverty and start delivering uh, interventions that make a difference 30 years down the track. We as politicians aren't going to benefit from some of that intervention. Uh, and so some of the work we're doing now um, will probably will reap the benefits in 20 years' time. But if you start looking at a lens of politics through what we like to use, kindness, empathy, well-being, then actually it doesn't matter what happens just in a political cycle. It what ha matters what happens over decades. This sounds like really concrete and you already um, took action. Mm. And how is it in the Emirates? Is it working, the budget is not affected yet, but policies are starting to be effective with the well-being measurement? So before I start, um, I just want to let you know that um, I visited New Zealand a couple of months ago. And I would like to commend Prime Minister Jacinda for her bold vision and for the groundbreaking work that New Zealand is leading when it comes to well-being. As Prime Minister said, well-being is holistic. It's not just one sector. It should, we, we want well-being in all sectors, in health, in education, and we want to interlink the well-being throughout these sectors. Right now, globally, there is no formula yet for doing that. Actually, there is no universal definition for well-being or happiness from government perspective. 
I see it more as entrepreneurial function. So we learn, we implement, we learn and evolve as we go. So in, it's very local and regional as well. So well-being is the right role for any government around the world. How to approach it depends on the development stage and the culture and the priorities in the country. So let me tell you about the UAE. We tackle well-being from policy angle through hardwiring the systems. So Prime Minister Jacinda said about uh, the budget. Budget is part of hardwiring the systems. We also uh, change the paradigm and the culture and drive intergovernmental collaborative projects. And let me tell you some concrete examples. When talking about hardwiring well-being, we in the UAE government appointed a senior role for chief happiness and well-being officer in each government entity. And the role of this officer is to bring well-being to the forefront of the agenda of this entity. Also, we developed a filter via a tool of what I call cost-benefit well-being analysis. So anything submitted to the cabinet has to go through its impact, potential impact on the well-being, not just the short term, but the long term on the society, in addition to the traditional cost-benefit analysis. We have developed a comprehensive well-being national agenda based on our priorities with a clear map, clear roles and responsibilities for all entities, because well-being can only be achieved collectively with all the government in yeah. the um, um, yeah, I mean, at the beginning, did they take you seriously? So I can imagine that they're just think, yeah, what is this happiness and well-being? And now they have to take it serious, as I get it, because all over there are officers. So well-being, happiness is a paradigm shift for government work. And I understand that new terminology, new thinking, new scopes need some time to sink in in people's mind and also in the public sector. So we need to be persistent and work on it and learn and evolve. And I think the work that New Zealand is doing, the work in the UA is doing, we need more countries to do more of that because this is a global collaboration. Yeah. We need to learn from each other. I absolutely agree. And there's networks that exist which are fantastic. But I think the reason we need to start taking this work seriously, and you're right, in the early days, yeah, I think it was... a lot of people, there's just this uh, fluffy thing yeah. here, what are you it was talking about? As, yeah. It was treated as, uh, as woolly, um, a nice to have, experimental. I think the OECD's really added some heft. Um, but there's another reason I think it needs to be taken seriously. I mean, right here at the World Economic Forum, we've heard, uh, you know, discussion around what's happening to global growth rates, uh, discussion around what's happening to trade, now, those might be conversations we're having separately, but actually, if you distill down what's happening to trade uh, and some, some of our tit-for-tat trade wars, it's become a proxy for dissatisfaction domestically. Some might argue that's what Brexit is. Some might argue some of the other uh, uh, populist uh, uh, rises that we've seen within Europe, that they are proxies for dissatisfaction. Our people are telling us that politics is not delivering and meeting their expectations. Yep. And so this is not woolly, it is critical. This is how we bring meaning and results for the people who vote for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not ideological either. It doesn't have to be something just progressive governments do. I think it is about finally saying this is how we match expectations and try and build trust back into our institutions again, no matter where we are in the world. But Better Life Index is your baby, actually. And um, wouldn't you wish that this could be become international standard and people would take it more seriously? Oh, it is. It's, it's not only that, uh, but uh, first of all, uh, Financial Times yesterday, op-ed page, Yacinda Ardern, uh, about well-being. Yeah. You know, right. it's yeah. not woolly. <laughs> it's not woolly. No, it says there why it's not woolly, so I won't expand it. <laughs> but um, now, am I worried? I think we are being asked, we're being demanded. There's an exigence uh, of, of, of not only the public, but every single individual, every single institution, uh, you know, uh, collectives, what they're saying, how can you do better? So 
we recently had, uh, you know, Joe Stiglitz, and we had uh, Monsieur Fitoussi together with our chief statistician, Martin Durand, who played a very important role in defining the indicators to measure the SDGs that I just referred to a moment ago. And uh, they put out these 12 recommendations on how to get, uh, how to do this better. The importance of using a dashboard for comparability, although that's not the end of the story, but it helps you objectively. The second is a quality and comparability of existing metrics, but then also better measures of sustainability. Sometimes that terrain gets a little woolly and then you get, you depart from uh, objective <coughs> indicators. But it's not about objective indicators only. The objective indicators are the first stage and then you take policy decisions which are judgmental. This is where politicians cannot be substituted. This is where they know about where the elected, the, 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 the electorate wants them to be, wants them to take them, you know, and they're demanding and they're rewarding or punishing those that do not do this. Remember, you, you put it at the right level. This is about the policy level and it is those responsible and for us uh, that uh, produce the elements for the politicians to then take the final decisions, we just got to get better and better and better at delivering. Now, uh, uh, lo and behold, what is our economic survey of the New Zealand going to be about that we're going to deliver that mid-year. It's going to be entirely about the well-being agenda. We already had done for Austria, for example, one around the Better Life Index. We did for Slovenia and for Slovakia now the whole national development plan around the SDGs. So you can see that, that this is becoming policy, this is becoming real, and it is becoming mm -hmm. the law shift. of the land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is becoming planning and development and the allocation of resources, which is crucial when it comes to planning, the allocation of resources is being done accordingly. So you say there is a shift. You really observe shift. I see mm -hmm. that it's an irreversible shift mm -hmm. and it comes from the demands of the people that we get better at it by identifying those sources of anger, those sources of frustration, those sources of insatisfaction that have taken all these countries that I mentioned months and months and months simply to form a government and then to have such fragile coalitions that even the best leaders cannot take the necessary decisions because then one of the members of the coalition will fall off and they have to call a, a new election, etc., etc. So this fragmentation of the uh, economics has uh, taken us to a fragmentation of the politics, fragmentation of the social aspects, and clearly to a profound uh, a fragmentation of politics as we know it, and therefore uh, complicating governance uh, enormously. This is why this is a key, this question of finding out what it is that people really want and aspire to is absolutely crucial to getting the governance right. It's not just one more statistical tool. It is crucial for the quality of government going forward. Crucial. And wouldn't it be very important to have uh, international standards or to convince media that about every GDP report they have to add a uh, better life index or human development index. I mean, there has to be a start we're, we're, somewhere. We're, we're, we're past that. We are now in but the business. Have you seen the IMF we're now in the business of Monday? showing why it is yeah, so but on important. Monday, IMF and, and was comparing very, the numbers yeah. now. But they yeah. just talked about GDP, and the media just talked about the GDP. Still, still, Absolutely. it's really, it's very crucial. And that's, that's uh, what Eric, that, I think you would. That's what that report mm -hmm. was going to be about. Mm -hmm. But again, this is not because every single report has to go to the broadest measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, that one was was about GDP, and that's what it was about. And they delivered on GDP, but there are other measurements which are, mm -hmm. as we mm -hmm. have and it's shown just here, not more mentioned, important. Yeah. It's just not mentioned well, so in the I think it's wonderful what mm -hmm. uh, Angel and the OECD is doing and what's being done in, in New Zealand, uh, UAE, um, because I think there's a growing consensus that we need these, these other measures. 
Um, one big advantage that GDP has is the great precision that it can be measured with and the dollar values. And, and this is something that I think is part of why it captures the attention at, at, in, in, in the public. Um, we're working on a, a, a metric that also supplements the GDP. Uh, in fact, we call it GDPB, B for focusing on the benefit side, that takes a lot of these uh, benefits and puts them in dollar terms so they can be compared to the GDP numbers. Like I think, free digital services, yes. like Wikipedia. In particular, like, for yeah. instance, free digital services. Yeah. I mean, so, so just to, to understand the, the distinction here, it's worth it's having just a little bit of economics. When you buy something, buy a pair of shoes or an encyclopedia, what you pay for it goes into the GDP. But the benefit you get from it is not necessarily, in fact, rarely is the same as what you pay for it. If I pay $50 for shoes, but I would have been willing to pay as much as $70, I'm getting $20 worth of benefit, the difference between those. The GDP goes up by 50, but my benefit goes up by 20. Um, if it's Wikipedia and it's free, then GDP goes up by zero. <laughs> but I may be getting a lot of benefit from it. So what we've actually done is measure how much benefit each person gets from a whole set of different goods. So we do massive online choice experiments where we ask how much you would be willing to trade off for Wikipedia, for jet travel, for uh, Facebook, for um, other internet services. And what we now have is a set of data that describes how much value people get. For instance, we found in our survey, as I was surprised how high the number was, the average person uh, would have to be paid $48 per month to give up Facebook for one month. Some people it was less, some people it was more, but that was the, the median value. And now we have a set of values for all these different goods that give us the benefits people are getting from goods, as well as the costs. And Ultimately, the dollar value from GDPB can, can be put on a basis alongside GDP, and we can see how that changes over time. And back to your point about the digital goods, this is very important because, as you said at the very beginning, um, the economy is becoming increasingly digital. Mm -hmm. And digital goods often have zero marginal cost. All the apps on your phone, uh, music services, and they are invisible in the GDP. In fact, information services altogether in the U US GDP accounted for 4.6% of total GDP in the early 1980s, 1983. Today, with the explosion of digital services, what do you think the number is, is par a share of GDP? It's still 4.6%. It just goes to show that they have completely missed all of these free digital services. Um, again, this is what Simon Kuznets and the team intended. They were not trying to measure the benefits, but if we want to measure the benefits, we have no choice but to have an alternative way of directly measuring them. Luckily, digitization is also part of the solution because we can now do online, massive online choice experiments. Hundreds of thousands of millions of people, we can survey them and have them do these comparisons. And that's exactly what we've been doing. Avi Kolis at MIT, a, a PhD student who's been leading this effort, uh, Felix Eggers, Erwin Dewert, um, Kevin Fox and I have all been working on this. And we now have data from these large numbers of people that we've gathered through the internet to get, get these benefits. And I think ultimately, for the 21st century, we're going to have a set of metrics based on benefits, just as in the 20th century, we had some metrics based on production. So you say we have a lot of alternatives already, but actually, they're just completely, we have to be realistic here, they're just completely ignored by the financial markets, because financial markets and anal analysts and banks and so, they're completely focused on GDP and not on the alternative indices, which we already have. In, in, in various, just, Mariano. So what I find really interesting mm -hmm. is that on the one hand, what you're saying, which I agree with, is that we're mismeasuring, we're not very good at measuring all these areas that are free, whether it's digital or you know, care at home. Yes. Um, but there's also some old tools that were quite useful, you know, right? Because you're talking about also some sort of modern, interesting new ways to right. measure the things tools. that are mismeasured, like intangibles. But there were some old tools that were really useful that we've forgotten about. And one of them to measure output and growth and the economy was input-output analysis that I'm not sure why we've abandoned it to the extent that we have. It was basically a toolkit that really allowed us to understand the structural composition of the economy, looking at different sectors, how they're linked. So for example, the finance question, the big problem with finance is not finance, it's what finance has been doing, which has been financing finance. <laughs> I know that sounds like 
saying the same word many times, but it's true. Finance has basically been financing the uh, finance, insurance, and real estate, FIRE. It's called FIRE to make you think, FIRE. Um, now, mm -hmm. that would have been much more evident if we were looking at how all the different sectors are interacting. Now, that's sort of you know, a problem case, but there's also really interesting good things that are happening that As we're not necessarily very good at. a little bit, I just sorry? wanted to allow the audience yeah. to put sure, questions. Sorry. I'm, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. because we're running out of time. Please, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, good afternoon or good morning. My name is Maria McIntosh Robinson. I'm from Jamaica. And I really love um, where this discussion and the focus of this panel is. My question to the panelists is, is this enough? And the reason why I raise it is for small emerging markets or emer markets that are less homogeneous, so they have more complicated problems, is it really that the government and the governance do not know this information? They don't know that the populace is unhappy, they're restive, they have these issues? Or is there, are there other challenges that if this data was available, which it will be hopefully on a more worldwide basis, are there other challenges to them actually acting or taking action, which is the ultimate purpose of this work? And I think one could think it's only for rich countries because both of you are very rich countries. I think, you know, there are some universals regardless of your current uh, development status and, and it's politics. You know, we all have to overcome self-interest uh, and oftentimes there will be competing demands as there is in, in, in any um, domestic political situation. And I think probably one of the biggest uh, issues to overcome is that uh, this approach requires us to invest in areas where we often don't downstream see the, the benefit of. And, you know, we always say you're better off to spend, for instance, a, a dollar on early childhood education than you are a prison bed. Uh, but uh, it's very hard to measure uh, and then politically promote how many people you prevented from entering into your justice system. So there's politics in all of this, which complicates it and makes it difficult. But I do think that actually being able to stand up and tell a story through some of the data sets that we're now able to, it helped build, it's helped to, to build a mandate for political change and to operate differently. We just have to be willing, I think, to put aside some of that short-term self-interest. Uh, and that goes for any political, um, regardless of developed or developing. Thank you for the questions. Many questions around, please. Um, it's a pity we're running out of time. Uh, my name is Gilberto Marin, Grupo Alquimara from Mexico. Uh, I, I just want to put uh, some uh, uh, real facts. Uh, in Brazil, during the government of Lula and then Dilma, they reduced a lot of poverty, but then it finalized close to a chaos. And then Bolsonaro take power, he stayed yesterday, and he's going to go through a complete process of the new reforms. In Mexico, we have those new reforms in the last six years, six years with uh, Peña Nieto, and he lost completely. Now he's in the new government uh, trying to attack the poverty and the inequality. <laughs> Uh, the last years, of course, in Mexico, they grow about 2%, and they are planning to go about 2%. So <laughs> that's the question about the GDP with the re reality of the, of the power of the politicians and really the happiness and reduce the inequality. Could you comment on that, uh, Mr. Gurria? <laughs> difficult question. And no, not so difficult. There's a question of allocation. Mm -hmm. There's a question of distribution. And there's a question of the budget, well. the budget, the budget. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, where and when is it that the responsibility comes in and kicks in to equalize the level playing field or at least to make opportunities the same? You will not have uh, results the same because individuals are different. But at least the opportunities make them more equal. That is where... Uh, the, the, the governments come in. That is where the diagnosis is important precisely to know because there are countries in which education will be fault, the countries in which the health system will be at fault, there are uh, cases in which the skills will be at fault, and there are uh, questions in which uh, maybe all of the above will be at fault. So uh, we need to know where the problem is and then try to fix it within the restrictions that a budget provides. Last question from my side, because we are running out of time. I'm really sorry. Uh, it went quickly. Time flies. Um, just uh, one short answer. Um, Sarkozy, 10 years ago, he said at the WEF, um, and he said, this is the end of GDP. 
And my question at the end is, can you give a time frame, frame when will this be <laughs> over, that this um, obsessive focus on one single number, when will this be over? So, um, rather than focusing on the time frame, I will take the optimistic side. Exactly. This, the well-being thing, needs global efforts. And we have something called the Happiness and Well-being uh, Coalition with six uh, founding uh, uh, countries. And I would like to take this opportunity to invite more countries to join in this, this discussion, because the more countries join, the more we can develop this quickly and have practical applications of well-being in governments for the benefit of people. Global movement, and then it goes quicker. Jacinda Arden, what would you say? I don't think it's the <laughs> end of GDP. I think it's the beginning, though, of doing things differently. Um, and we distill it down in New Zealand just to say that for us, it's about bringing kindness and empathy to governance, and measures of well-being help us to do that. Thank you so much. Andre Gurria, what would you say? When will we have this beginning that all around the world they see that there are, there's new economy and new measurements? It gives me great hope when I see... A quick these answer, I'm sorry. ...members of the panel <laughs> we need uh, looking at this <laughs> issue and pointing the way forward. So we're going to follow their advice, particularly the political leaders who are telling us where to go. They represent the people. They are the ones who have to tell us where to go. Eric, guess? Well, I think the answer is what we started with. It's, it's infinity. It's not going to happen because I agree. This is one thing we may all agree with on the panel, that, that uh, if anything, we now are going to have more and better understanding of not just GDP, but going beyond it. We have digital metrics that can measure things much more precisely than in the past. So this is really the promise of the 21st century, is to have a new set of metrics that will give us a better understanding, not throwing away GDP, but going beyond it. A brave guess at the end, Mariana. <laughs> We've talked about the macro. The micro is about value. And I think we will not sort this question out until we really have a new understanding of how to talk about, but also measure, value as collectively created through different types of actors, public actors, private actors, third sector actors, civil society, trade unions got us the weekend, for God's sake. You know, they create value too, but we only hear the word value creator and wealth creator for business. And I think we really need to talk about collective value creation and that'll help this discussion. Thank you so much for this lively, energetic debate. Yeah, thank you so much to all the participants. And you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you for the question. And let's embrace new economy and happy WEF, happy Davos, happy world. Thank you.